This week we're going to start talking about calculus. We'll cover the first three chapters. We'll talk about limits, continuity, and differentiation. First, limits. As an introduction, consider the function x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. The domain of this function is all of the numbers except 1. Here's a graph of this function. The graph has a hole when x is equal to 1 because 1 is not in the domain of the function. But we might ask, how does f behave when x is close to 1? To try to answer this question, we can draw a table of our values. Let's start with 0 0.9 and 1.1. These numbers are close to 1. We can calculate the value of f of x at these two numbers. If x is equal to 0 0.9, we can put 0 0.9 into the formula. 0 0.9 squared minus 1 divided by 0 0.9 minus 1. I'll leave for you to check is 1.1. If we put 1.1 into this formula, 1.1 squared minus 1 divided by 1.1 minus 1, I will leave it for you to check is 2.1. Let's go even closer to 1. What about if we considered the numbers 0 0.99 and 1.01? Again, we could put these into the formula. If x is 0 0.99, then f of x is 1.99. If x is equal to 1.01, then f of x is equal to 2.01. Now we're starting to understand. Let's go even closer. 0 0.999, 1.001. .001. Again, we can calculate f of x at these two points. And if we wanted to, we can keep going closer and closer to 1. And we can see that it looks like if x is close to 1, then f of x is close to 2. How do we write this in maths? In maths, we have a particular notation for this. We write that the limit as x tends to 1 of f of x is equal to 2. This means when x gets closer and closer to 1, but not equal to 1, f of x gets closer and closer to 2. The same graph again. Note that the limit as x tends to 1 of f of x is equal to 2, but our function f is not defined when x is equal to 1. Another function, a different function. Now define g to be equal to, this is the same, x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. If x is not equal to 1, and we'll define g of x to be equal to 1 if x is equal to 1. We could do the same thing as before. We could calculate values of x close to 1 but not equal to 1. And we could say that if x is close to 1 but not equal to 1, then g of x is equal to 2. So we write that the limit as x tends to 1, when x gets closer and closer to 1 but not equal to 1, of g of x is equal to 2. But note here that in this example, g of 1 exists, but g of 1 is not equal to 2. Let's look at a third function. Now the function h. h is just equal to x plus 1. How does h behave when x is close to 1? We can see that if x is close to 1, but not equal to 1, h of x is close to 2. So we can write that the limit as x tends to 1 of h of x is equal to 2. And for this example, h of 1 is also equal to 2. The limit of h of x as x tends to 1 is equal to h of 1. Some more examples. First, let's think about the identity function. That's the function f of x is equal to x. Using the ideas from earlier, 
we could write that the limit as x tends to some value x0, mach of x must be equal to x0. Next, a constant function. And we could choose any number. Let's just suppose we have the constant function f of x equals 13. What is the limit as x tends to some point x0 of 13? x is close to x0. The function is up here. The function is, it's easy to say the function is close to 13 because the function is always equal to 13. The limit as x tends to x0 of 13 is, is equal to 13. And that's true for any constant number. Sometimes limits don't exist. And I'm going to demonstrate that with these two examples. Let's suppose u is the function which is equal to 0 or equal to 1, depending on if x is negative or non-negative. And let's suppose v of x is the function 0 if x is non-positive, or sine 1 divided by x if x is positive. First, let's look at u. The function looks like this. The limit is x tends to 0. u of x does not exist. Why is that true? To have a limit, we need to talk about x close to 0. If x is close to 0, but positive, let's suppose x is this orange spot, then f of x is equal to 1. So u of x is equal to 1. But if we looked instead at this red spot, a negative number which is close to 0, then, f of, then u of x is equal to 0. But 0 is not close to 1. We don't have one number that we're always close to if we're close to 0. So the limit as x tends to 0 cannot exist. What about the function v of x? The limit as x tends to 0 of v of x doesn't exist because the function v of, v of x oscillates up and down too quickly if x is a positive number and x tends to 0. So again, there doesn't exist a particular number that we're always close to. That means the limit does not exist. We have some laws which we can use to calculate limits. Let's suppose we have some numbers, L, M, C, and K. Let's suppose we have two functions, F and G. Let's suppose that we know that the limit is X tends to C of F of X is equal to L, and the limit is X tends to C of G of X is equal to M. Rule number one is the sum rule. The limit of f plus g is equal to l plus m, as we would expect it to be. The difference rule, almost the same, but with a minus sign. The limit of f minus g must be l minus m. Suppose we multiply our function f by a constant k. The limit of kf is equal to k multiplied by the limit of f. In other words, any time we have a constant inside a limit, we can take it outside. What if we have two functions multiplied together? The limit of f multiplied by g is equal to ln. The limit of f divided by g, as we would expect, is L divided by m. Here we need to be a little bit careful. This is only true if f, if m is not 0. We have a power rule. The limit of f to the power n is equal to the limit of f all to the power n. And we have a root rule. Again, we need to be a little bit careful. We need to make sure that the nth root of L exists. 
because of course the square root, of, for example, of minus one doesn't exist in the real numbers. Then the limit of the nth root of f is the nth root of l. We can use these limit laws to calculate limits such as this. Calculate the limit as x tends to 2 of x cubed plus 4x squared minus 3. First thing we can do is we can use the sum and the difference rules to separate this up into three easier limits. Then I want to use the constant rule to take this 4 outside. And I want to use the power rule to take this cubed outside of the limit and this squared outside of the limit. That gives us the limit of x, all cubed, plus 4 times the limit of x, all squared, minus the limit of 3. We know that the limit of x is just 2, and the limit of 3 is 3. Put these numbers in, and we calculate that the answer is 21. Another one. Find the limit as x tends to 5, or x to the power of 4 plus x squared minus 1 over x squared plus 5. Quickly check, are we dividing by 0? Put 5 in here. 5 squared plus 5, that's not 0 on the bottom, so that's OK. That, that means we can use the quotient rule to write this as a limit divided by a limit. We can use the sum and difference rules to break this up into each smaller limits, and then use the power rule to, put, to calculate each of these limits. I'll leave it for you to double check that the solution is 649 divided by 30. But isn't there an easier way to calculate limits like this? The answer is yes. We can use theorems such as this one. Let's suppose we have a polynomial function. That's number x to the power n, n plus number x to the power n minus 1 plus etc. plus number x plus number. Anytime we have a polynomial function and we want to calculate the limit as x tends to c, all we need to do is we need to put c into the function. The limit as x tends to c of p of x is always equal to the key of c. What about if we have a rational function? In other words, what if we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial? Then, again, the limit as x tends to c of p of x divided by q of x is equal to p of c divided by q of c. Just be careful, this is true if q of c is not to 0. Now that we have this theorem, if e, we can calculate limits like this a quicker way. We don't need to, need to use the limit laws, we can just use the theorem. Calculate the limit as x tends to minus 1. As long as we don't, we're not divided by 0, we can just put minus 1 in place of x. So we get minus 1 cubed plus 4 times minus 1 squared minus 3 divided by minus 1 squared plus 5. And you can check this is 0. But what do we do if we do have 0 on the bottom? Well, if we want to calculate the limit as x tends to c of p of x divided by q of x, if q of c is equal to 0. For example, calculate this limit. If we just replace x by 1, we're going to end up with 0 divided by 0. And this is something we never, never, never want. 0 divided by 0 is not a number. This is not the answer to this question. Instead, we're going to try to factorize our two polynomials. And before I go on, just remember, we're only doing this if x is not equal to 1. Because limit as x tends to 1 means 
the interest is in x close to 1 but not equal to 1. So it's always okay to assume that x is not equal to 1. We can factorize our function into x minus 1, x plus 1, divided by x, x minus 1. And then, of course, x minus 1 cancels with x minus 1, and we're left with x plus 2 divided by x. So the limit that we want is the same as the limit of x tends to 1 of x plus 2 divided by x. And now we don't have zero in the, on the bottom, so now it's okay to replace x by one. And we end up with the answer of three. We have a theorem called the sandwich theorem. Let's suppose we have three functions, which look something like this. We have a green function on the bottom, a red function on the top, and we have a blue function which is sandwiched or squeezed between the green and the red functions. Precisely, let's suppose that f of x is less than equal to g of x is less than equal to h of x. For all x close to c, but x not equal to c. Go back to the graph. We need this inequality to be true close to C, but not equal to C. Over on the left, I don't care what happens. Over on the right, again, I don't care what happens. All that matters is what happens close to C. So we need to have this inequality close to C, but because we're talking about limits, this is, we don't need this to be true for X at C. And we need that the limit of the bottom function is the same as the limit of the top function. We go back to the picture. This green function and this red function need to move together and touch or have the same limits when x is equal to c. Then the theorem tells us that the middle function, the function which is sandwiched in the middle, must also have the same limit as the other two functions. We can use the sandwich theorem to solve problems like this. Let's suppose that we're told this inequality is true for all x close to zero. And we're asked to calculate the limit as x tends to zero of the function in the middle. To use the sandwich theorem, instead of looking at the function in the middle, we look at the functions on the sides. The limit of the function on the left, that's the smaller function, we calculate as 1. And the limit of the bigger function, the function on the right, is also equal to 1. The middle function is squashed between 1 and 1, sandwiched between 1 and 1. So the limit of the middle function must be the same. The limit of the middle function must also be equal to 1. Another theorem, which is similar to the sandwich theorem. Let's suppose we have two functions. Let's suppose that f is the smaller function and g is the, the bigger function. Let's suppose this is true for all x close to c, but x not equal to c. So we can imagine that we have a functions like this. If we are close to c, G is the biggest, the bigger function, and f is the smaller function. Over on the left, we don't care what happens. It doesn't matter which function is bigger on the, over on the left. It doesn't matter which function is bigger only on the right. All we care about is what happens close to c. So let's suppose f is less than or equal to g, close to c. And let's suppose that the two limits as x tends to c exists. Then we know that the limit is x 
tends to c of f of x must be less than or equal to the limit as x tends to c of g of x. The limit of the smaller function is smaller than the limit of the bigger function. Our second chapter of the day is continuity. This is a continuous function. A continuous function is a function that we can draw without lifting our pen from the paper. If I wanted to draw this function, I would put my pen on the paper, I would start drawing, and in all in one go, I could draw the function. I don't have to lift my pen off the paper. Here's a function which is not continuous. If I wanted to draw the graph of this function, I could draw the first part, the left part, but then I'd have to lift my pen off the paper, move it, and then put it back down onto it. That's the idea, but this is math, so we need to be more precise than this. A function is continuous at a point C in its domain if three rules are satisfied. Rule number one, we need f of C to exist. We need the limit of f as x tends to C to exist. And we need these two numbers to be the same. All three rules are true then the function is continuous. If one of the rules is not true, then the function is not continuous. F is not continuous at the point C, then we say F is discontinuous at C, and we say that F is a point of discontinuity of F. Let's think about this function. I'm not going to bother giving the formula for this function instead, I'm just going to show a picture. Where is this function continuous? Where is this function discontinuous? First of all, what about at zero? x is equal to zero. Is the function continuous? The answer is yes f of 1, so f of 0 exists and is equal to 1. The limit as x tends to 0 of f of x also exists and is equal to 1. And because these two numbers are the same, the function is continuous. What about between 0 and 1? Again, the function is continuous here because the limit exists and is equal to f of c. Is the function continuous at 1? The answer is no. Why is it not continuous at 1? Because the limit uh, as x tends to 1 of f of x does not exist. x is close to 1, but on the left, we're going to get a different number from if x is close to 1, but on the right. Between 1 and 2, yes, continuous. We could draw this with a pen without lifting our pen off the paper. Or, more precisely, this is continuous because the limit is equal to f of c. What about at 2? Is it continuous here? The answer is no. The limit exists, the limit is equal to 1. f of 2 exists, f of 2 is equal to 2. But these two numbers are different. The function is not continuous at 2. Between 2 and 4, it's continuous. I can draw this without lifting my pen. The limit is equal to f of c. And finally, at 4, the function is not continuous because the limit is equal to 1, but f of 4 is equal to a half. The function square root of 4 minus x squared is a picture. This function is continuous at every number of c between minus 2 and 2. This function g has a point of discontinuity at 0. If we were drawing this graph, we'd have to lift our pen up and move it at 0. G is continuous at every point except zero.
this function h is discontinuous at 1 and at 2, but is continuous everywhere else. Instead of saying that a function is continuous at every point in its domain, we want a shortcut. We just say that f is a continuous function. If we have some continuous functions, we can combine them together, and we still have a continuous function. Let's suppose f and g are continuous at c. Then f plus g is continuous. f minus g is continuous. A number multiplied by f is continuous. fg is continuous. f divided by g is continuous. Just be careful, this is true if g of c is not zero, because we don't want to divide by zero. f to the power n is continuous as well. For the nth root of f, we need to be a little bit careful. We need this to be defined close to c. So this is just me being careful. As long as the function is defined close to c, then again, the nth root of a continuous function is continuous. Every polynomial is continuous. We have a rational function, and if, as long as we're not divided by zero, then p divided by q is continuous. Sine and cos are continuous. We can do composites of two continuous functions. G composed of f means First we calculate f of x, and then we calculate g of f of x. We could imagine a picture looking like this. We start at c, first we do f, we get to, to a number f of c, and then we do g to get to g of f of c. Let's suppose f is continuous at the point c, and let's suppose that g is continuous at the point where this green arrow is starting, we want g to be continuous at f of c. As long as these facts are both true, then g composed of f is continuous at c. For example, show that the square root of x squared minus 2x minus 5 is continuous on its domain. We can break this apart into smaller or easier functions. First of all, square root of t is continuous by a theorem we just saw. As long as square root of t is defined, it's continuous. x squared minus 2x minus 5, this is a polynomial. Every polynomial is continuous, so this function is continuous. So we have a continuous function composed of a continuous function. Continuous function composed of Function must be continuous. Show that x to the power of 2 divided by 3 divided by 1 plus x to the power of 4 is continuous. x to the power of 2 over 3 is continuous. x squ squared is a polynomial, so that's continuous. Take the cubed root of x squared, but we're still continuous. 1 plus x to the power of 4 is a polynomial. All polynomials are continuous. Because we're not dividing by zero, we must have a continuous function. If we have continuous functions, then we can take a function g outside of the limit. Instead of doing limit of g of f, we can swap the positions of the limit of g. Instead of doing limit of g, we can do g of limit of f of x. But we can use that to calculate limits such as this. So suppose we want the limit as x tends to pi over 2 of cos of 2x plus sine of 3 pi over 2 plus x. 
because it's continuous, so we can swap the positions of limit and cos. We end up with cos of the limit of 2x plus sine 3 pi over 2 plus x. By the sum rule, I can break this into two smaller limits. First one is easy. The limit is x tends to pi over 2 of 2x plus just 3 pi. Let's look at the second one. Sine is continuous, so we can swap the positions of limit and sine. Instead of doing the limit of sine, we can do sine of the limit. We go sine of the limit of this. And at this point, we can just put the numbers in, calculate it, and we get that we find that the answer is minus one. Our final chapter for today is differentiation. Is a road sign. What does this mean? This means that the road is going upwards. What this means is if we travel forward 100 meters, the road will rise by 3 meters. In mathematics, we write this as, we describe this as the slope, and we calculate that the slope is equal to 3 divided by 100. More generally, if we have a line like this, we can draw a triangle under the line. We can measure A and B, and we can say that the slope of this green line is B divided by A. This line has slope 1, because as we go forward 3, we also go up 3. This line has slope 2. This line is going downwards. We go forward four, we go down two. To show we're going down, we use minus two. And to calculate the slope is minus two divided by four, or minus a half. Negative slopes means going down, positive slopes means going up. What if we don't have a straight line? What if we have a function? How can we find the slope of a function like this at the point x0? What we can do is we can draw a straight line which just touches the function at x0 and which ha has the same slope as the function at x0. And then we can draw our triangle, we can measure a and b, and then we can calculate that the slope is b divided by a. We say that the slope of the blue function at the point x0, to x0 is the same as the slope of the tangent line at x equal to x0. For example, let's look at the function y is equal to x squared. If, for example, x0 is equal to 1, we could draw the tangent line, we could draw our triangle, measure the sides of the triangle, and we can calculate that the slope of this blue line is equal to 2. Therefore, the slope of the blue function is also equal to 2 when x0 is equal to 1. Or we could look at 0. The slope at 0 is equal to 0. If we look at 2, if x0 is equal to 2, we can draw the tangent line, we can measure it, and we can find that the slope here is equal to 4. Instead of drawing pictures and measuring them, how can we calculate the slope of the tangent line? Let's go back to a general function, any function f of x. And I want to calculate the slope of the tangent line to the function when x is equal to x0. Instead, I'm going to calculate the slope of a different line. I'm going to calculate the slope of this orange line, which connects two points together on the function.
draw these dotted lines, we can see that the base of the triangle is x0 plus h minus x0, and the height is f at x0 plus h minus f at x0. So then we know the slope of the orange line. The slope of the orange line is the height of this triangle divided by the base of this triangle. Slope of the orange line must be f at x0 plus h minus f at x0 divided by h. But we don't want the slope of the orange line, we want the slope of the green line. Look what happens when we make h smaller. When we make h smaller, the orange line is getting closer and closer to the green line h is very, very small, we can say that the slope of the green line is, the, is almost the same as the slope of the orange line. We have a formula for the slope of the orange line. In fact, we can say if h is very, very close to zero, then the slope of the green line is very, very close to the slope of the orange line. Close to is something we were talking about earlier today. Close to means limits. The derivative of a function f at the point x0, or to say it's another way, the slope of the tangent line, is the limit as h tends to 0 of f of x0 plus h minus f of x0 divided by h. And we write this as f prime of x0. This is true if this limit exists, because we know sometimes limits exist, sometimes limits do not exist. If this limit exists, then we have a derivative of f at x0. And that means the slope of the function or the slope of the tangent line to the function at this point. For example, consider the function 1 divided by x. I want to calculate the derivative of this function. So I'm going to start with my formula. The derivative of g, or g prime, is the limit as h tends to 0 of g of x 0 plus h minus g of x 0 divided by h. We put our function in here. g of x0, of course, is just 1 divided by x0. g of x0 plus h, replace the x by x0 plus h, we get 1 divided by x0 plus h. And on the bottom, we, have, we still have our h. We need to simplify this function before we can take the limit. Think back to primary school maths. How do we do things like... Um, a third plus a quarter. We have to put everything over the same denominator. We can write this as 4 over 12 plus 3 over 12, and then we can add them together. I want to do the same thing here. I want to write everything over x0, x0 plus h, and then I can calculate the difference between them. I get x0 minus x0 plus h on the top. And on the bottom, I have an h, an x0, and an x0 plus h. That's minus 1 divided by x0, x0 plus h, because the h's will cancel. Place h by 0, and we get minus 1 divided by x0 squared. Here is a graph of this function. We now have a formula for the derivative, or the slope of this function. For example, if x is equal to 2, the slope must be minus a quarter. If x is equal to minus 1, the slope must be equal to minus 1. And just from the picture, this looks like this is correct. 
if the derivative of f at x0 exists, then we say that f is differentiable at the point x0. If a function is differentiable at every point in its domain, then we have a shortcut, we just say that f is differentiable. If a function is differentiable, then we have a new function, f prime, which, which has the same domain. f maps from d to r, and f prime also maps from d to r. This new function is called the derivative of f. Differentiate x divided by x minus 1. Differentiate is another way of saying find the derivative of. We're going to need to use our definition. The derivative of f is equal to a limit. The form it is, is the limit is h tends to 0 of f at x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Now, we're going to need f at x plus h. Take the formula and replace every x by x plus h. We have x plus h on the top, and on the bottom, instead of x minus 1, we have x plus h minus 1. Put that in here. Replace f of x by x over x minus 1. We need to use the same trick, trick as before. We need everything over the same denominator, everything over x minus 1, x plus 1, x plus h minus 1. Simplify this. Cancel the h's. We're calculating the limit as h tends to 0 of minus 1 divided by x minus 1, x plus h minus 1. And at this point, we can replace h by 0. And we can find that the limit is equal to minus 1 divided by x minus 1 squared. There's many ways to write the derivative of f of x. We've been using prime notation so far, f prime of x. We could also write y prime. Or, there's another common way to write this, we could write dy dx, or df dx, or d dx of f of x, or y dot, or f dot of x. Why do we have lots of notations? Partly it's because campus was started by two people, and they both claimed that they were the person that thought of it first. And after that, they ended up hating each other. So Isaac Newton, who was British, used the notation f dot and y dot. Mm -hmm. Gottfried Leibniz, who was from what is now called Germany, uses, used df, dx, dy, dx notation. The notation that we've been using so far, the prime notation, was introduced later by an Italian called Lagrange. Let's suppose we want to calculate or we want to refer to the derivative of y equal to f of x at a particular point, at the point x equal to x0. And then again, we have different notations. I could write f prime r at x0, or I could write dy dx at x is equal to x0. This vertical line means at or df dx at x equals x0, or d dx of f of x at the point x equals x0. For example, let's suppose u of x is equal to 1 over x, and let's suppose we want to calculate the derivative of u at the point 4. 
In other words, we want U prime at four. We want the derivative of one divided by x at x is to four. The derivative of one divided by x, we've done this already, we know that this is minus one of x squared. So we want minus one of x squared at x equal to four. Replace x by four, we get minus one divided by 16. Show that f of x equal to the absolute value of x is differentiable between minus infinity and zero between zero and infinity, but is not differentiable at zero. First, let's look at positive x. x is a positive number, and the absolute value of x is the same as x. We're doing the limit as x, as h tends to zero, x plus h minus x divided by h. X, x is cancelled, we end up with h divided by h. We're just doing the limit of 1, which is equal to 1. Similarly, if x is a negative number, then now the absolute value of x is equal to minus x. Think about this, the absolute value of minus 3 is equal to minus minus 3. Do the same things we did before, use the, the limit formula, and we find that the limit is equal to minus 1. These limits exist as long as x is not 0. So f is differentiable between minus infinity and 0, and between 0 and infinity. What happens at 0? At 0, we're going to be wanting to calculate the limit of the absolute value of h divided by h. h is negative. This is plus h divided by h, or plus 1. h is negative. This is minus h divided by h, or minus 1. We would need to calculate the limit as x tends to 0 of something which is sometimes plus 1, sometimes minus 1. But of course, that doesn't exist. So this function is not differentiable at zero. There's an example of a function which doesn't have a derivative at a point. When does a function not have a derivative at a point? Let's suppose our function has a corner. If the function has a corner, then the derivative does not exist at x zero. Likewise, if we have a cusp like this, then the derivative does not exist. If we have a vertical tangent, then we can't do the limit because we get infinity or minus infinity, which doesn't exist. So the derivative of f doesn't exist at x0. If we have a discontinuity, then the derivative does not exist. Here's another picture of a discontinuity. The derivative does not exist. I've just said, if f is not continuous, then f does not have a derivative. Think back to start a term when we looked at symbolic logic. In symbolic logic, we said that not q implies not p is the same as p implies q. Not continuous implies not differentiable. Turn this around. f differentiable implies f is continuous. And that is the end of this week's lesson. The next two weeks, we're not going to have a lesson. Our next lesson is three weeks later, when we will continue talking about calculus. Are there any questions?